Good morning. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the economic development trip that I have planned on Thursday and Friday along with our director of the new Partnership for Economic Progress, Debbie Durham. We will be uh, leading a trip to Chicago uh, to call on Illinois-based businesses that already have operations in Iowa. We also plan to talk to other Illinois businesses that we think might be good prospects for either relocating or expanding in our state. And uh, Iowa is quite a contrast with Illinois. Uh, Illinois is one of the states that's got significant financial problems, and they've gone the route of raising taxes on both individuals and businesses. Uh, they have unresolved problems with their state pension system, and I think they have uh, the, probably the poorest, um, the most uh, underfunded public employee pension system in the country, which means they're going to have massive tax increases to try to deal with that problem. They also have borrowed substantial money, uh, so they have big debt issues facing them, and they're not a right-to-work state. So I think we have a lot of advantages over Illinois. I've already written several letters to uh, companies in Illinois encouraging them to consider expanding in Iowa. We'll be calling on some of those uh, on this trip. Uh, I, I also had hoped to be able to tout Iowa's uh, plans of uh, reducing the uh, uh, commercial industrial property taxes. Unfortunately, that did not get done this session, but that will be one of the things on the top of the agenda for the next uh, uh, session of the legislature. And I'm very hopeful uh, uh, from the statements made by both Democrats and Republicans after adjourning that they will work with us and next year we will get that done. Failure to act on property taxes will mean uh, that we will see historic increases in property taxes over the next five years because of the record commodity prices, which will trigger a roll up in property taxes for residential and agriculture as well as commercial and industrial. Uh, needless to say, I'm disappointed that didn't get done, but I am tenaciously committed to seeing it does get accomplished uh, in 2012. With that, I want to turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds. Thank you, Governor. Uh, property tax relief is vital to keeping Iowa competitive uh, with other states across the nation and globally. We must uh, address commercial property tax in a way that, ec that uh, aids our economic development efforts. Without reform, Iowa will continue to have one of the highest commercial property tax rates in the nation. Governor Branstad and I will continue to work tirelessly for property tax relief until Iowans who have waited for over 30 years to see some relief in their property taxes uh, see this accomplished. We believe that both Republican and Democrats can come together to create an attractive climate that um, is conducive to job growth and will prevent the looming $1.3 billion tax increase uh, on property tax owners. Okay, we'd be glad to respond to your questions. What companies are you uh, going to talk to to try to convince Well, I will be calling on some companies that have already made significant investments in Iowa, and, and they will include Medline Industries, which has 300 employees in Dubuque, USG, which has, uh, I think, 200 employees in Fort Dodge, Transco Railroad Products, which has 76 employees in Sioux City, and SSAB, which used to be um, IBSCO, uh, that's uh, the Swedish Steel Company, which just recently expanded their operation at Mount Pelier, which is between Davenport and Muscatine. Uh, they've added significant research jobs there, in addition to uh, the the uh, uh, steel plant, uh, steel uh, 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 steel foundry where they recycle uh, metal. Um, so those are the existing. Now, I'm not going to divulge the names of the other prospects uh, for reasons that uh, it just uh, is not good uh, economic development strategy, but these are existing companies that already have invested in Iowa that we're going to be expressing our appreciation of the investments they've made, encourage them to consider further expansions in our state. But we do have a number of others uh, that we will be calling on as well. And we will have a whole delegation will be working with Debbie and I on these uh, prospects. What steps are you taking in the interim to pave the way for property tax compromise, given what happened last time? Well, first of all, we are intending to work with local governments to assure them that uh, we have a strategy that's going to uh, protect them from a loss of revenue, while at the same time 
uh, we reduce the tax burden for commercial and industrial property. So, and we are also going to be looking at uh, some of the mandates that uh, state has placed on local governments that can be eliminated, that can be part of that assurance to local governments. So I'm going to be visiting with mayors and local officials and really putting together a comprehensive strategy uh, to deal with this issue and also just to assure them that the state does have a five-year budget plan that we have money set aside in that budget plan to provide uh, replacement money for the reduction in property taxes as a result of phasing down uh, the tax on commercial industrial uh, commercial and industrial property. I was just going to say, you know, in the past, local governments have dealt with a lot of unfunded mandates. So the governor is completely accurate when he talks about assuring them that we have a five-year budget plan in place and to make sure that we're all working from the same set of numbers. So to sit down as a group and truly look and get on board with the same set of numbers so we can walk through what we need to do to um, enact commercial property tax relief, spur growth and development in all areas of the state of Iowa. It's time, time for political posturing is really over. Uh, they know there's no chance that's going to happen. It requires two-thirds of both houses. The Republicans have no interest in playing that political game with them. So uh, it's, uh, we, we need to focus on those things that, uh, that are going to bring us business and jobs to the state of Iowa uh, and stop the political posturing. You know, they were in session here for almost six months. The last thing Iowans want is them to come back, start getting paid again so they can posture more at the taxpayer's expense. That's not what Iowans want. They want us to do what we're doing, focusing on jobs, going out and calling on business that can bring business and jobs to our state. That's exactly what we're going to do. So you support this plan to reduce the number of workforce Well, first of all, let me say, I want to commend Teresa Willard and the Department of Workforce Development for coming up with a strategy that I think can be even more effective than the way things have been done in the past. Um, if, as you know, federal dollars have been cut, and the state also faced some significant budget issues, uh, somewhat caused by the, um, the, the, uh, the increase in the public employee um, salaries, uh, which uh, Governor Culver agreed to without negotiations. And they have to eat that out of their budget like the other departments and agencies. But what Teresa Whaler came up with is a strategy to actually increase access and make it easier for people uh, to um, get access to job opportunities. So they're working with the, uh, the libraries, working with the community colleges, working with the National Guard armories, working with the Veterans Affairs offices in all 99 counties uh, to have access to this. Uh, these offices, many of which were open only part time and were only open limited hours, we're going to have more hours and more access than was available before and obviously do and we're looking at ways that we can provide better service at less cost to the taxpayers and 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 I think that's what uh, what I ones are looking for and uh, appreciate us uh, moving forward with a new way to provide services as opposed to saying we have to obviously do everything the old way the expensive way that that frankly and the other thing is we, we said, and, and you heard this throughout the session, we're not going to use one-time money for ongoing expenses anymore. That's another old way they've been doing things that we're going to stop. And so they did that, and they also didn't provide an, enough funding to even pay for it. So this, we got to get past the political posturing and focus on things that are going to get results and bring business and jobs and also help people find employment opportunities. Right. Yeah, Ar Ar armories. Well, well, I'm not exactly sure what's being done everywhere. I do know that we have 16 one-stop shop uh, regional offices, and Kim can talk a little more about that. But but I would also say we're also trying to make access much more accessible and available on more hours, and that's where armories, the uh, the Veterans Affairs offices. Right. The libraries, community colleges are all, and, and you know, we need to quit working in silos and start working together, and that's one of the things I'm excited about here. But it seemed a little incongruous to be getting a news release from Workforce Development about opening 42 workforce sites in 
in armories to help returning soldiers find jobs. At the same time, they're closing 37 offices. That was all part of their plan. They, in fact, if you they they announced this way back so in in February. In those armory offices. It's just a computer well, I, I think there are people there. Sometimes I'm not I'm not exactly sure. I'm I'm not sure that. Uh, but but what we're trying to do is partner with and work with the National Guard, the libraries, community colleges, the county departments of Veterans Affairs, and they have people. It's, it's kind of like what. What Kim did when she was That's county I treasurer, was gonna exactly. I was going to say, it's you know, the same it, the, the, you know, what we did is we partnered with the county treasurers to offer better services to people, in, 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 and 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 I I just remember the bureaucrats and all the establishment was against this, but we finally did a pilot project in I think was how many counties in Southwest Six. Iowa. Well, it's just like driver's license. There's different ways of providing service and what we did. And you've heard the story. We went from one day a week to five days a week utilizing county treasurer's office that was already an office. The infrastructure was in place. But we stepped up and took on the additional duties so we could do it cheaper and expand services. It's the same thing with paying property taxes and vehicle tags online. We live in a technical age where Internet is accessible. And so people could go online 24-7 and re pay their property taxes, renew their vehicle tags. Oh, my gosh, we thought we were going to close down Treasurer's Office across the state of Iowa. No, we expanded service. We took um, took uh, took an opportunity to expand services at a lower cost and provide access to people. This is no different. We're expanding access points. It's not where they're going to you know, figure out what they need to do exa exactly, but it's a way for them to enter into the system to make the initial con contact with workforce development so they can start the process to serve them and they have gone from what is it from 55 to 16 regional sites every individual is in within 50 miles of the site but in addition to that they have currently have 60 access points with the goals of going to 190 now a lot of these sites were only open one day a week one afternoon not very accessible but people will have there there's some Saturday available times it's open later in the evenings People need access at different times, and this gives them the opportunity to have that access. It's a step in the right direction. We continually need to look at ways that we can become more efficient and more effective, and this is one way to do it. It doesn't stop. You know, I've been quoted all over for saying how impressed I was with the Creston site. I was impressed with the Creston site. That was two years ago. It was a one-stop shop. They'd run, won an award for being proactive and really looking at how they could provide services in a different manner. Well, it doesn't stop there. We need to continue that progress, and this is exactly what Director Whaler and that workforce development is doing, looking at effective ways that they can provide services. Another reality that they're dealing with, go and ahead, I'll turn the ahead, microphone go, over here. Ahead, <laughs> it's all right, you're on a roll, just stay with it. <laughs> <laughs> is, we're looking at reduced federal dollars. And that's reality also. So they need to continually be looking at how they're going to provide these services, realizing that they probably will be receiving less federal dollars also. So it's, it's a way to provide extended service. And that's what we need to be talking about. I would also I point out. Want to make sure that you're not firing people that work at these other offices. No, we're not hiring. No, 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 no. No, we're not hiring more people. We're, we're, we're not hiring more people. We don't have the resources to do that. But we are trying to provide. Uh, better access and more opportunities for people even though uh, we're going to have fewer people working for workforce development. I would also point out and I want to commend workforce development on this. 32 states are in debt to the federal government and their unemployment trust funds broke. That's not true in Iowa. In, in, in fact, Iowa employers have been paying higher assessments in order to replenish that fund as we've gone through this recession. But I think the good news is that uh, we're going to be in a situation not too far down the road to be able to reduce those uh, unemployment taxes again. And that is one other positive thing that we're going to be able to tout in Illinois and other states when we go, because our state's unemployment trust fund is not broke, and there will not be the kind of increased taxes that they're going to face in Illinois and other states. I've been to several meetings with regard to what the Postal Service is doing, and I think it's pretty unconscionable. They don't seem to have any plan. Uh, I, 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 at the invitation of the mayor of Laurelville, 
I went to the meeting, a town meeting that they had in that community. It was attended by over 200 local citizens. A lot of good ideas from the citizens. A lot more good ideas from the citizens than from the Postal Service. Uh, the, the only thing I can figure out is if you don't have a permanent postmaster, they're going to try to close your post office. And Iowa and West Virginia seem to be the hardest hit states in this. Uh, Delaware, zero. A senator from Delaware has introduced a bill supported by the Postal Service. I, I wonder if there's any politics in this. I don't know. But uh, it's kind of an interesting situation. Um, New Hartford, which is Chuck Grassley's uh, hometown, is one of them where they're trying to close. Um, I, 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 when the meeting we went to in Fort Dodge, which was attended by a number of the mayor's local officials, uh, I think it was the mayor that said that uh, when they led, read the letter from Senator Grassley, they closed up their books and cut the meeting off. So I, I guess my feeling is that, and, and, and it's not just the local post offices, they're trying to close two service centers, one in Sioux City and one in Fort Dodge. Uh, you maybe heard the, uh, the ridiculous uh, um, uh, thing that uh, the Postal Service submitted to Sioux City. The mayor thought it was one of those uh, Nigerian uh, chain uh, uh, <laughs> emails or something. But I think, and, and I'm, I'm in the process of working uh, with uh, other governors on this and also working with the mayors of the communities that are affected, uh, I think they should put a moratorium in place and develop a thoughtful, systematic strategy to deal with their budget problems. Their problem is primarily caused uh, by their pension system and the fact that Congress has required them to fund their pension system, uh, which is a problem a lot of states are going to deal with now too. But, but this is an issue, the pension system, and then also the cost of having a postmaster, which I guess postmasters are paid a lot more than the other employees in the postal system in every community. Why does every little town have to have a postmaster? Can't you just have somebody in charge that's, well, that doesn't have the title being a postmaster? Those are the kinds of questions that were raised by the citizens at Laurelville and communities all across the state. The Postal Service has not answered them. They have not put together a thoughtful, systematic strategy. I believe the citizens of this country especially rural America, deserve that. And our state seems to be particularly uh, hard hit and targeted. And uh, I, as governor of this state, I believe I have a responsibility and obligation to go to bat for those communities and for maintaining that service. And uh, not to say that some post offices can or won't be closed, but there should be a thoughtful and systematic approach towards this and when you have a community like Laurelville where you have 29 businesses, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to close that post office. And that was just the one that I was at, but there's been, there's like, like you said, it's now, it was 57, it's now 178. Uh, doesn't seem to be any thoughtful, systematic approach. Uh, nobody will tell us what the criteria are, uh, and the citizens are rightly upset and uh, signing petitions and, and, uh, demanding to be heard from the Postal Service, and they, and they deserve it. Oh, do you know what the time frame is on that? I have no idea. And, and, and the Postal Service has been very vague about this. In, in fact, I didn't even get an official notice. Uh, I mean, I, got, I was contacted by the mayor. And, and, and I would say the mayor of Laurelville has been a real leader in this effort, and, and there's been a meeting in Fort Dodge, and, and uh, in fact, he and I are drafting a, a letter that we're sending out to mayors of the communities that are affected. I'm also working, um, I think, with the governor of West Virginia to put together a letter to governors. I did bring this up at the National Governors Meeting in Salt Lake City, uh, and I'm very hopeful that uh, we can get a groundswell of, of opposition out here in, in rural America that can get the attention of the Postal Service and, and, and get them to put in place a moratorium until they have uh, put together a thoughtful and systematic plan that addresses their their problem I, I, as opposed to just uh, willy-nilly closing a bunch of rural post offices. I'm going to change gears on you really quickly. I have a quick question about um, education following up with the summit. Um, what are some reforms that you want to see at the higher education level? Just very basic. 
Well, in higher education, the summit primarily focused on uh, preparation of teachers and principals. Uh, we think that, uh, and, and we heard from some of the actions that have been taken in some of the other states, uh, we think it makes sense to kind of look at that. How can we develop a better process of preparing mm -hmm. teachers? And one of the things I think comes across real clearly, the experts seem to agree on, more clinical time. Uh, having been president of Des Moines University, medical schools, you know, we have two years uh, of what they call didactic classroom and, 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 and uh, in the uh, labs, but then two years of clinical where they're out there in hospitals and clinics working under the supervision of, of physicians, experienced physicians, and getting that hands-on learning. And then in medical school, then after they graduate, they still got to go to residency at least three years in whatever uh, specialty they're going into. So we don't have nearly that kind of hands-on experience as part of the teacher training program. I think that's certainly one thing that can be done, a bigger, more, of, more robust clinical part of preparing people to be teachers. Uh, principals, the same thing, uh, but especially focusing on leadership skills because with principals, you need people that are going to be able to be um, consensus builders and people that know how to uh, really motivate and encourage. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of the experts say, you know, if you have a great principal, you can take teachers that might have only been uh, mediocre and, and make them great teachers with the right kind of motivation and encouragement and working together as teams. So uh, in terms of higher ed, that's where higher ed can play a key role better preparing people to be principals and teachers. And the other role, and this is an area where I think higher ed and, and uh, area education agencies and the other people uh, improve professional development. We heard a lot of complaint from teachers that professional development has not been very relevant to what they do and hasn't really given them the kind of tools and, and help that they need. So that's another area that I think needs to be dramatically improved is professional development. In light of all the federal dollars that would be at stake uh, for our state, have you been sweating out the debt ceiling talks? And then also, what do you think <laughs> about Republicans who would oppose lifting the debt ceiling? Well, first of all, I, um, I figured all along that eventually that they would reach some kind of an agreement on the debt ceiling. Uh, and, and I would certainly say those people who were elected in 2010 change the tenure of the debate in Washington. Instead of talking about more bailouts and more federal spending and more entitlement programs, they're now actually talking about reducing uh, the federal debt. And th the, th the concern is, however, this is a very modest first step. Uh, as I'm, my understanding is federal spending is still going up 8% a year, and you know the national economy is only growing a dismal less than 2% right now. So obviously that's not sustainable. And there has to be, and, and so this is a very modest first step, but it's a step in the right direction as opposed to the wrong direction. It doesn't include tax increases, and I, but but I think there's a lot more to be done. So support it, vote for it, or again? Well, I, I think each congressman and senator has to, in their own conscience, decide whether uh, this is adequate or not. Uh, so I'm not going to try to tell them how they should vote. Obviously, I don't know all the details of this. I know it was difficult. I know that uh, they, you know, the House of Representatives passed several plans that weren't taken up by the Senate, uh, and uh, uh, this is something that they have worked out with the President, so it will be signed. I think that's important in terms of uh, in avoiding a default, and consequently, uh, um, the leadership's, I think, I'm sure, going to work diligently to, to get it approved. But for individual congressmen and senators, I think they have to look at and, and, and measure whether they think this is adequate or not. Do you feel some sympathy for Tim Pawlenty that he is getting hit with this? He left behind a deficit to tap the same way that you accused Governor Culver of having a deficit? Much different situation. Using Much different situation. Language. Well, first of all, I. You know, he's a conservative who was replaced by a liberal who wanted to raise taxes. I'm a conservative who replaced a liberal. Uh, much different. Well, it's it, no the the deficit that we had under Culver was based on his spending. 
the deficit that they're accusing plenty of is based on um, the, the present governor's recommendations for a level of spending, which the Republican-controlled uh, legislature in Minnesota, of course, objected to and objected to the tax increases. And eventually, um, uh, the governor of Minnesota uh, reneged, I, I mean, uh, reconsidered and, 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 and agreed not to, uh, agreed to a budget that didn't include the tax increases that he pushed for throughout the whole session.